he had spent so much time actually in the larynx of the throat of the worm, it was so well defined that he could actually get the worm to talk. In the annals of sci-fi cinematic history, there have been plenty of memorable beasts and creatures birthed within the soil or sands of dusty locales, from the Sarlacc of Star Wars Return of the Jedi, to the graboids of Tremors, and even the multi-mouthed sandworms of Tim Burton's Nightmares and Beetlejuice. What comes from beneath often becomes legend, but in truth, the look of all of them were inspired by the one true desert mover and shaker, the Shy Halud, otherwise known as the sandworms of Frank Herbert's 1965 novel, Dune. Over the decades, the native sand-dwelling worms of the planet Arrakis have become the visual shorthand representing Herbert's world-building novels, easily identified by even those who have never read the Dune books. But for the filmmakers who fell in love with Herbert's Dune, such as a teenaged Denis Villeneuve, who eventually made it a career goal to bring the writer's world to life on the big screen, the sandworm is a sacred beast necessary to tell the themes, scale, and subtext of the story. With Villeneuve's dream finally realized with the release of Dune Part 1 in 2021, audiences were able to see the director's vision of Herbert's seminal sandworms. To set the stage, it's important to know that Herbert took his sandworms so seriously that he gave them scientific names, Geonematodium arachnus and Shaihaludata gigantica. Inspired by that kind of detailed dedication, director Denis Villeneuve collaborated with Dune production designer Patrice Vermette for eight months developing their iteration of all things integral to Dune. Their fine-tuning produced a 120-page concept design book that was then handed over to visual effects supervisor Paul Lambert and the other department heads to figure how to make them real, either practically or digitally. The sandworms, as an entity in the film, were designated as an entirely digital creation. In the lore of the story, the Shai Hulud are a native species to Arrakis that can grow up to 1,300 feet long and 131 feet thick. Worshipped by the Fremen people of the planet, they navigate underground, burrowing below the dunes of the desert landscape. And it's there that the sandworms produce larvae that excrete a substance that, once mixed with water, ends up on the surface as the rare and much sought-after spice melange. Lambert says in those early days of VFX exploration, they figured out that there were two aspects to the sandworms, the creature and their environment. One can't exist without the other. So when we got the imagery, they were these spectacular drawings and we had to try and figure out, okay, so this is a creature which is like gonna have to move. It's not gonna be overly animated. It's gonna move quite slowly, but then like, what does that mean? So basically what we came up with was this idea that the worm was actually made of these hard plates and in between these plates, you had this soft membrane. And the idea was that we based it on like an accordion. So basically, these these like rigid plates would stay rigid, but then like there would be a tiny bit of movement in between each plate. In figuring out the physical traits of their version of a sandworm, they could then determine the physics of how the shape, size, and its textured skin would move within the sand dunes. Using real nature as a reference for testing, Lambert says they did animation tests to find the closest real-world comparison for their movement model. The guys and girls like spent a long time investigating earthworms, how they move, investigating snakes, how they move, you know, basically any creature who moved in that particular vein, we basically experimented with. And what became apparent though was, was things became very biological and very clinical. Things didn't look cinematic at all. Frustrated by their failure in finding any creature that could, even scaled, move the vast amounts of sand akin to what a sandworm would shift in its natural burrowing, Lambert admits they had to get their heads out of the sand and into the sea. There was a lot of trial and error going on, and what we were seeing was that when you do collapse a dune and when you do push up a dune, you get all of these ripples occurring, and like it, it, it looks very much like water. And that's where the animation team then started to move away from like an earthworm or a snake, but actually more towards a whale. You would see footage of a whale like cresting waves and smashing through waves. And, and the more and more iterations we did, it actually started to feel like it was more of a sand whale. The term sand whale stuck and became the terminology that best describes the direction they would go in marrying Patrice Vermette's concept sketches to the practicalities of such a beast that would swim through Arrakis' sandy dunes. Even the interior of the sandworm's great maw, which would be fully revealed twice in the film, was designed with fine hairs akin to the baleen hair inside certain whales that use it to filter their food. Lambert says Robin Luckham, the animation director at DNEG who built the interior of its mouth, spent so much time inside that orifice that he promised, if needed, the sandworm could even be capable of something unexpected. 
he had spent so much time actually in the larynx of the throat of the worm it was so well defined that he could actually get the worm to talk now i never heard the worm talk but like he he said that like there was a there was enough controls in there to be able to make any sound you wanted. And with the worm, it's one of those rare times where you kind of interacted more with the sound department. It doesn't usually happen. Visual effects is so busy and sound is so busy. It's in editorial where like everything comes together. But for this, we did actually wait on sound to provide a sound based on initial renderings, which would then go backwards and forwards. In all the sequences in the film where the open dunes are the backdrop for the action, the sandworms serve the simmering threat that's just meters away ready to swallow whatever dares disturb the surface. In the last act, the Fremen god and Paul Atreides finally square off in a jaw-dropping confrontation of gargantuan scale. Rising out of the desert, the Shai Hulud is fully revealed to Paul in all its glory. Preparing for that sequence, Lambert says they went on location to accomplish what became the mandate for Dune. Try to get as much in camera as possible and then overlay that with the necessary Necessary VFX elements to complete the shot. Of course it's going to have a big VFX component but what we were able to do was a good blend of practical techniques to help the visual effects process to be successful. And that view of Paul running away from the worm and then like you have the circle of the worm behind it with a bunch of sand kicking up and that was the goal to produce a moving version of that. Now that does entail a hell of a lot of work to, to actually get that thing to, to, to actually move you know the camera was on a buggy, it was traveling, and Timothy was uh, running. And when you see him fall in the movie, that was actually an accident, but like we kept it and, uh, and like played off that. Lambert adds that for that particular scene, they didn't use blue screen either. Instead, they used a real rocky outcrop at the location as a visual reference of height for the actor to look at for eye lines and to influence the eventual lighting of the sequence. The rocks would then be rotoscoped out of the shot and replaced by the digital sandworm. It gave us the ideal light of like having this dark creature behind him and obviously doing various takes there would be footsteps everywhere so like we had to clean that up again seeking any opportunity to add practical effects for realism lambert says that special effects supervisor gerd nefzer created a setup where they placed a steel plate under the desert sand that would vibrate and produce an organic natural pattern on the sand we copied that digitally to make it even bigger but part of that was that Paul would be running and when you watch the scene, you'll see footsteps, but then they disappear because the idea is that the sand is constantly shaking. And when you turn and then you see Paul running up to Jessica, who's on this outcrop, and then like you see sand falling from the rocks and that was all added due to all of the shaking. So yeah, it took months to put that sequence together. But you know, the goal was to get that original concept art and like building up to that. So that Paul's further away, then like, the worm rises and rises and rises until it gets to the point where it stops and it was really interesting. Our like first versions of the animation of the worm when he's first looking at Paul was a little bit of animated in that it kind of looked as if the worm was questioning who Paul was and that wasn't that wasn't the scene and like Denis, Denis being, being Denis like kind of explained it like when he saw it he said Paul look this isn't uh, this isn't the worm trying to understand Paul like these two do not know who they are. It's almost like a goat meeting a lobster. <laughs> Denis will sometimes say things like this, but they're like, yeah, I totally understand what you mean. It, there is no connection between them at all. <laughs> The success of Dune Part 1 now ensures that the true extent of the Shai Hulud and its place and purpose in Paul Atreides' life will be fully realized in Dune Part 2, as Villeneuve hoped. If you're a Herbert reader, then you know what's coming, but Lambert can't spill what that will look like yet. However, some of what audiences will see was certainly teased, especially in that short glimpse of a Fremen warrior riding on the back of a sandworm. Surprisingly, Lambert shares that scene almost didn't make it into Dune Part 1. Today was playing with the idea whether like we should see somebody riding a sandworm in, in part one or, or, or not and it didn't actually appear till later into the schedule that we actually did that and we shot somebody on a buck on set and we were, like wind and things on him to get all of the interactive but then like we didn't actually put that shot together until very late in the sequence because it was undecided whether that was going to be in there but I can't talk about part two. I would love to talk about part two but I can't do it but that is just a taster of the epicness which is about to come. Let us know what you think of the look of the sandworms in Dune Part 1 and what you're most excited about for Part 2. And for anything else you might need to burrow under the sand for, stay right here with IGN.